were talking about a Middle Eastern war that... Hold on, let me check my notes really quick. Yep, America's actually making money off of this one. Wow, I forgot that was even possible. That's right, America is selling $8 billion worth of weapons to the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. Go back to the previous episode, that's one year of EPA funding's worth of money. So, a pretty decent chunk of change. The worry is that, well, the countries we're selling these weapons to are gonna use these weapons. Yeah, this is the one time you might want to remove the prominent Made in America sticker. In today's episode, we're going to look at the process it takes to sell a country weapons, and how in making this decision, the administration has managed to entirely avoid this process. We'll get to that later, though. Our story starts in 1976 with America's most forgettable modern president, Gerald Ford. Watching his campaign ads, well, you can see it was a pretty different time. Today, America enjoys the most precious gift of all. We are at peace. We're at peace with the world and at peace with ourselves. America is smiling again. And a great many people believe that the leadership of this steady, dependable man can keep America happy and secure. Yeah, man, Vietnam had really messed us up as a country. We were finally at peace and we were ready to regulate some arms sales. On June 30th, 1976, Gerald Ford signed into law the Arms Export Control Act. So now we can all name one other thing that guy did beside pardon Nixon. Now this act had a lot of things in it that our leaders have chuckled at and said, sure, okay. For example, the weapons foreign governments buy from the US have to be used for legitimate self-defense. Yeah, this little section has been a thorn in our side regarding doing business with Israel for quite some time now. Sorry for the video quality here, but it was 2007, and every second of every news story wasn't yet being posted and overanalyzed on YouTube. Well, the weapons of war and Israel's battle against Hezbollah. Did Israel violate U.S. rules by using American-made cluster bombs in civilian areas of Lebanon? Yeah, pretty hard to play the self-defense guard on that one. Those civilians in Lebanon? Well, let me think. They were about to attack us. We still tried, though, with officials at the Pentagon and State Department contending that Israel's use of the weapons was for self-defense and aimed at stopping the Hezbollah attacks that claimed the lives of about 40 Israeli soldiers and civilians, and, at worst, was only a technical violation. Now, fortunately for Israel, according to the government report on this incident, it should be stressed that the Arms Export Control Act does not define such critical terms as internal security and legitimate self-defense. It remains for the President or the Congress to define the meaning of such terms as they may apply to the question of a possible violation by a foreign country. Who would have guessed that a country whose founder famously said the best defense is a good offense would have an interesting interpretation of this? Now, as you probably know if you watch my Supreme Court coverage, if you ever end up with your back against a legal wall, just start asking for definitions and eventually you'll win. It's no coincidence that all of the best speeches start with <coughs> Webster's Dictionary defines... So they got off scot-free. And we're gonna come back to that in the Saudi Arabia incident later. But first, if you're like me, on the other potential violation of the Arms Export Control Act, well, you're probably thinking, oh, I don't know, that one crazy time in the 80s when America sold guns to Iran to finance guerrilla fighters in Nicaragua. Boy, did that statement not age well. What a wild time. When President Reagan and Attorney General Edwin Meese appeared in the White House briefing room on short notice today, no one was prepared for their surprising announcements that money from the controversial Iran arms deal was secretly funneled to the Contra rebels. Now, selling weapons to Iran soon after their cultural revolution and not telling anybody violated a separate and more enforceable part of this act. You have to report this stuff to the Speaker of the House and the head of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee 30 days before you do it. And I mean it goes into pages and pages of detail on this section. So Reagan couldn't just say, well, what's a report, or what's the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? That is, unless he really wanted to lean into the dementia card. What, too soon? 
Because of this, a report from Brown Law School found that there was no way in which President Reagan's actions could be squared with the Arms Export Control Act because of these 30-day reporting requirements. The question became, oh geez, how do we enforce this law? Generally, this law is preventative, but in this case, the sale had already happened. Despite its strong language, the Arms Enforcement Control Act did not provide for any criminal sanctions. This action could only be considered criminal in the event of a conspiracy to defraud the United States. Now, Reagan said that secrecy was because of the situation being sensitive and he wanted to protect the lives of the hostages, so he got off scot-free. Now, this brings us to today's weapons sales, where these two factors are key and in play, although the administration just killed both concerns with one stone. The president will reportedly use a rare federal provision that allows him to make an emergency declaration to make the sale. That would let him get around Congress. Okay, first, do we really have to call it rare? I swear, whenever Donald Trump does anything, we treat it like his administration found Shangri-La. Ah, he was the first man to actually read the Arms Enforcement Control Act, and you know what? He found out this was a thing. Ah, President Ronald Reagan invoked it in the 1980s, and both George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush used it for sales before the 1991 Gulf War and the 2003 Iraq War. And no, this actually wasn't something Reagan invoked to sell weapons to Iran. Instead, and this is true, he used that provision to send Stinger missiles to Saudi Arabia to deter Iranian threats to its oil infrastructure. Man, this is why the Middle East hates us. We have to sell weapons to the Iranians. Oh God, Iran's using our weapons to threaten Saudi Arabia. Sounds like an emergency to me. Let's get them even bigger guns. Also, great to see we're following in the footsteps of Gulf War I and the Iraq War. Hey, Iran, hope you're feeling okay over there. This emergency declaration is used so sparingly because Congress generally approves arms sales like they're an alt-right booth at a gun show. Generally, also, we go the Obama route of refusing to sell weapons to Egypt or Bahrain. Everyone pats themselves on the back, and then we sell the weapons a year or two down the line. Now, the first question people are raising is, Ah, oh, I can follow stretching the definition of internal security and legitimate self-defense only so far. Helping a foreign country fight a proxy war in a different foreign country, well, that feels a bit like offense. Fortunately for this administration, in what was originally a criticism of this arms sale until a few days ago when it became a defense of it, I guess, a former defense advisor was quoted as saying, when a country uses U.S. origin weapons for other than legitimate self-defense purposes, the administration must suspend further sales unless it issues a certification to Congress that there's an overwhelming national security need. To which I'm assuming the administration presumably responded, well, okay, we can do that. Seriously, how can you say, well, you definitely can't do that thing you want to do unless you follow one very simple step that you easily could do? I'll put him in his place. The other point is... Trump bypassed Congress by declaring an emergency over rising tensions with Iran. Lawmakers have been blocking weapon sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE for months. Yeah, Congress was blocking these arms sales. And this is where things get interesting because I spent an amount of time I'm not proud of trying to figure out where, between all these reporting requirements, was Congress given the right to block an arms sale. Every news source just kind of said, you know, they can block it, trust us. It turns out that these blocks are just Congress passing laws. Under current law, Congress must overcome two fundamental obstacles to block or mollify a presidential sale of military equipment. First, it must pass legislation expressing its will on the sale, and second, it must be capable of overriding a presumptive presidential veto of such legislation. So finally, in 2019, we have found a piece of gun control legislation capable of passing through Congress. As we established with Reagan's scandal, Congress has to be notified 30 days prior to the wrap-up of a successful arms transaction, unless you don't want to tell them. 
so they can use those 30 days to work on some laws that could amend and remove parts of these sales. Take for example. The House has just passed a bill which will fund a barrier at the southern border and avoid another government shutdown ahead of Friday's funding deadline. The bill includes more than $1.3 billion for 55 miles of fencing along the border. I know, sounds super relevant, right? What that bill also included in a subsection that we were all way too distracted to look at was a bunch of arms control stuff that is way too complicated to get into. Yeah, all that sort of just Trojan horsed its way into becoming law. This is the act Trump signed to reopen the government, and the act that is preventing these sales of weapons and training to these Gulf countries. Congress is free to pass legislation to block or mollify an arms sale up to any time before the point of delivery of the items involved. So that clock is ticking down, but things are yet to be delivered. Unfortunately for Congress, well, the bill also provides a check on their power, as all of the news sources have pointed out multiple times. I'll just go to the next step and quote the Arms Export Control Act itself. The letter of offer shall not be issued if the Congress, within 30 calendar days after receiving such certification, adopts a concurrent resolution stating that it objects to the proposed sale, unless the President states in his certification that an emergency exists which requires such sale in the national security interests of the United States. Basically, Congress has final say unless there's an emergency in which case you don't have to get approval from the slowest and least liked branch of the U.S. government. Makes sense on paper. Churchill, the Nazis are invading and you need weapons? Well, we have to debate this for 30 days, and the senator from Iowa is making a pretty good point for why we shouldn't be getting involved. Of course, in this case, he said the administration formally informed Congress that it is invoking an obscure provision of the Arms Export Control Act, but didn't adequately explain why it was doing so. Menendez added that the administration described years of malign Iranian behavior, but failed to identify what actually constitutes an emergency today. Here we are with calling it obscure again, like Donald Trump is some sort of legislative hipster or something. The laws you use are too mainstream. I like throwbacks to the 80s and 90s. Of course, the accusation being levied against the Trump administration right now is fake emergency. You're just using this to sell guns. But earlier in this episode, I said that if you ever have your back up against a legal wall, just start asking for definitions and you'll eventually win. Same logic applies here, because emergency was never defined. Somebody please buy the guys on Capitol Hill a dictionary already. Because of this, it's hard to look at the Middle East right now and confidently say, well, that's not not an emergency. I mean, Pompeo was super vague in his statement, but as we talked about recently, Iran's currently threatening to restart their nuclear program, which, yeah, you can put most of the blame on us for that one, and it seems like Iran was likely, best case scenario, adjacent to the recent attacks on four oil tankers. I'm not saying it is an emergency, but I'm definitely saying that if nobody has a definition for what an emergency is, it's hard to say that this is not an emergency. I'm sure sending Iran's opponents this $8 billion in weapons and training should do a ton to resolve this whole emergency. Until that next news story, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news, remember to click on the subscribe button floating to the left of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring, and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.